morning, everyone. Did you guys have a good Christmas? I can't hear anything, but I'm assuming you guys said yes. It's good to see everyone here. Um, as we as we walk into worship, let's um, let's stand if we're able. I'm just gonna pray us in before we get started. And let's take some time to come before the Lord God, the Lord God who loves us, the Lord God who created us, who fashioned us. Father, we, we just want to come before you as one body, Lord. As we remembered your first coming and as, it, as we continue to remember and look to your second coming, Jesus, may we just always have love in our hearts for you and for each other, God. So Holy Spirit, you are so welcome here in this place. May you fix our eyes on Jesus and nothing else, Lord. And I pray, Father, that we as a church would come, would become, come closer and closer to you each and every day, Lord. So, Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for, we just thank you for our church family here, Lord. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, let's, uh, let's say hello to each other. Welcome college group. And let's get going with worship. Sing people. your heart be troubled. Hold your head up. I don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, old God. Be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Praise go up as the walls coming down. All creation. 
this song all glory be to Christ did you guys know is actually I think the tune of this song is actually from like an old Scottish hymn like a secular Scottish hymn and that they sing actually around New Year's if I'm not mistaken and so we found out after we discovered this song but I thought it was fitting to sing as a church to close out our new year, to, or to close out our year together. Um, this song is called All Glory Be to Christ. And uh, my sister Maggie's gonna lead it.
Everything else is vain. So God, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that you would transform each and every one of us in this church, in our communities, Lord, to sing all glory be to Christ every single day with our words, with our mouth, with our actions, Lord, with our thoughts, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would transform this church, Lord, to be more like Jesus in his death and in his resurrection, Lord. So, God, we give you all the glory. We thank you, Father. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Hello, everybody. Hello, YNLA. Hello to college who's uh, visiting us today. You guys are fighting with us. Hi. Hi, guys. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, yeah, it's the 31st already. Oh, my goodness. It's 20, 2024 tomorrow. Crazy. Okay. But let me just quickly start us off with a few announcements. Um, and then afterward, we actually have a guest speaker for us today. So let me just uh, do our announcements. Um, our first announcement, we do have an 11 p.m. New Year's Eve service with the KM side. Um, you're welcome to join us there. I feel like 11 is kind of late for a lot of people, so if you uh, cannot make it or are unable to attend, I totally understand. Uh, just celebrate at home with your families. Um, uh, I will be there, uh, and Pastor James will also be there, so yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> moving on. Uh, we do have a few kind of volunteer requests that we need for today. Um, so we do have a snack sign-up sheet in the back, okay? So right now, we don't have anyone signed up for January. So um, unless you want no snacks next week, better sign up today. But anyway, um, secondly, we need to take down some of our Christmas decorations today. So if we're able to you know, stay after, maybe help pick up heavy stuff and take them out of the sanctuary. Your help would be greatly appreciated. So please do stick around, help us, uh, help our servant team out with that. Um, also, I believe next week, next Sunday is our uh, dim sum Sunday, dim sum lunch Sunday. So old college, we, you guys are, as well. So if you're able to come to that, we would love to have you guys join us there. Um, is that it? Is that it? I think that's it that I'm thinking of. Huh? Women's ministry? Women's there's women's ministry. I don't know when. Uh, when is it? January. Thank you, Gloria. January 13th is women's ministry. It's a, it's a Saturday. What? It's at 10 a.m. on sa- January 13th, Saturday. 10. I'll have a slide next week, I promise. Uh, yeah. And here's other volunteer opportunities for you um, in case you need that up there. And uh, let's also pray for college ministry. They are going on retreat this week. So hopefully you guys have a good time. Hopefully you have a blessed time. And if you have not signed up yet, Pastor James needs the money by today. So please turn it in today. 
Okay, um, I think that's it. Um, yeah, let me just introduce our guest preacher for today. It is our very own Pastor James from our college ministry. Come, just come up. Uh, everyone knows you. I almost tripped and died. I'm so shocked at the, the terrible introduction. Boo, boo. Uh, but good morning, everybody. It is always a blessing to be here to uh, share the word. And I always have fun with Wine LA because there's interactions and stuff like that. But uh, before we begin, uh, we have this tradition in college ministry where we awkwardly say hi to one another for about a minute. So can we just uh, maybe get up from our seats, say hi to people, uh, say, maybe say hi to someone new, and then I'll bring us back and we'll get started. All right, let's sit down. Main needs. I, I like, I just noticed how with uh, adults, there's this natural, like, progression where you say hi and then you relax. But with college students, it's like, blah, 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 blah. there's like a lot of talking and, and fun festivities, which is great. Paul, did you have a question? I see you do this. Oh, <laughs> they had a question. Hello. All righty. Um, good morning, everybody. So, uh, today, for us, I have a sermon topic that I've been thinking about for a long time. I labeled it as setting a rule of life for the new year. Uh, and we're going to sort of discuss a little bit in detail about what a rule of life is. And I think this is probably a really good time for us to be talking about this subject because we're essentially at New Year's Eve. And with New Year's Eve, we always have that one dreaded thing that we uh, come up with every single year, which is resolutions, right? How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? With resolutions, typically, we make these sort of promises to ourselves, a sort of vague, sort of abstract, like uh, one of my favorites is lose weight. Uh, I always make this resolution, and I never seem to be able to keep this, but that's my own problem. Uh, another resolution that I typically hear a lot is for people to travel more. Right, we would love to go visit other countries. We would love to go to uh, somewhere that we haven't been, to spend more time with friends and family and all that good stuff. Uh, spend more time with family, right? That's a typical New Year's resolution that we tend to come up with. Maybe we want to spend more time with our, with our kids, with our siblings, with our parents, so on and so forth. Uh, another one, uh, this is kind of a big one, is improve finances. Right? A lot of us are often very concerned about the status of our, our, our well-being and, and our finances and all these things. So we try to come up with ways for us to make that sort of manageable for the new year. And so these are some typical New Year's resolutions that we tend to make at the end of every year. Now, obviously, there's probably a lot more that's not on there. And these are just some general examples. But what's interesting is when we talk about New Year's resolutions... Within that subject, there's also this conversation about spiritual resolutions as well. Right? With spiritual resolutions, we come up with sort of very similar promises where we say we want to pray more often. We'll set this as a goal for ourselves, that, yeah, we will pray more often in this new year. We will read the Bible more, that more than what we've done the previous year, we're going to try to include scripture reading a lot more in our lives. Another one is uh, tithing regularly. Right? Uh, maybe we tell ourselves, oh, I haven't been really good at tithing this past year because I've forgotten. And, and maybe this next year, I'm going to do a lot better. I'm going to try to be more consistent. Uh, maybe some of us say we're going to invite a friend to church, maybe invite a coworker, and so on and so forth. And uh, for the rare people, right, fasting. Maybe I'll fast this upcoming year as a way to improve my spiritual health. And again, we come up with so many different types of spiritual resolutions, just like New Year's resolutions. But the sort of overarching question that I have for us today is simply this. How often do we find ourselves committing to these practices that we said we will commit to? 
And it doesn't necessarily just have to be about spirituality. Let's talk about New Year's resolution as well. I share with college students all the time that I always make it a point to go to the gym. And I can tell you how many times I went to the gym this past year. I went a total of 12 times, one a, once a month. How do I know this? Because my app tells me every time I go to the gym. So it is a terrible number. But again, like we, we make up all these resolutions, and it's, we find ourselves breaking this more often than not. Not because we have this sinister desire, not because we want to break these resolutions, but sometimes life just seems to get in the way. And so as life gets in the way, I want us to pause for a second and reflect on this question. Right now that we're at the end of 2022, right, what resolutions have you set, or I'm sorry, not 2022, 2023, right, look back towards 2022 and think, what resolutions have you set to grow in your relationship with God? Right, really think about that for a second, right, what, what have you done in 2022, what have you promised yourself, I guess in a sense where you're telling yourself, I'm going to grow in my relationship with God, what have you sort of done to achieve that goal? Right. Following up with that, is your relationship now with God better, worse, or the same as before? Do you actually see improvement in your overall faith? Do you see how your faith has become action? Do you find yourself participating more with the, the, uh, the local church and so on and so forth? Or do you find yourself a little bit more withdrawn? Maybe you're uncertain about your faith. Maybe you feel a little bit eh about your faith. You know, a lot of times we have to think about these things, and the reason why this is such an important topic for us today uh, is because of something that a pastor said. His name is Jeremy Lineman, and he's a pastor at a Trinity Community Church in Missouri. He says, we often fail to grow spiritually because we haven't planned and made space for a deep abiding fellowship with God. The reason why this talk about resolutions or uh, rather the rule of life is so important is because more often than not, we have this desire to come up with these promises towards God, but we sometimes fall short because we aren't specific enough. Right? We haven't planned this out thoroughly. We sort of have this general statement of, I'm going to do this with God, but we don't really necessarily follow through on that. Just like with me in the gym. Right? Uh, last year, I said, I'm going to go more often. Did I ex explicitly set how often I'll go? Absolutely not. Did I say once a week? Did I say once a month? No, I didn't even think about any of that. I just told myself I will go to the gym more often. But this is why that intentionality, being extremely specific, being purposeful is so important when it comes to your overall spiritual health. I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk a little bit about a rule of life, right? What is that? A rule of life, it contains spiritual, relational, and vocational rhythms needed to sustain the life in Christ we've been called to. And it doesn't change much year in, excuse me, year in and year out. I think this is a very concise definition of what a rule of life actually entails. It is a plan. It is a very specific plan that you set for the sake of your spiritual health. And it is something that we're called to. And it might not necessarily change year in and year out. Another definition that I really like, it is uh, this. It is an intentional, conscious plan to keep God at the center of everything that we do. And this is written by a guy named Pete Scazzaro. Right? He's uh, very famous for writing the, the Emotionally Healthy Church series. And so essentially with the rule of life, what we're talking about is a very meticulous plan for you and I to live out so that we can honor and glorify God and be closer and closer with him. Right? That's the fundamental thing that we're talking about today as we sort of uh, reflect back at the end of the year. And the reason why is because today our entire focus is on setting a rule of life for ourselves and committing to it for the purposes of abiding in the hope that is in Christ. I know I totally jumbled the words a little bit, but that's sort of the main thing that we're going to try to do today as we talk about rule of life and see how that comes out in Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like to ask you to open up to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25. Um, I'll be reading this from the ESV version. And I'm sure many of you know I don't put the thing on screen, so... Uh, you know, take out your phones, take out your Bibles, uh, and share with one another. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. All right, this is what it says. It says in verse 19, Therefore, brothers, 
since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as, it, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, as we start doing a deep dive into the book of Hebrews, uh, Lord, I just pray that you'd reveal all these things that you have set in store to us today, Lord God. Uh, maybe for some of us, we need conviction. Maybe for some of us, we need a reminder. Maybe for some of us, we just have to give, be given a chance to try. But Lord, I pray that as we look through Hebrews, you would give us clear indications of how we can continually uh, sharpen and grow our, in our relationship with you. So God, would you be with us? Would you open up our, our hearts and our minds and our ears to receive your word today? Lord, I thank you and I pray in your name. Amen. Alrighty, so uh, with Hebrews, I want to share just a little bit about the background of Hebrews because I think this is kind of important for us to know. Really quickly with Hebrews, uh, there isn't a, a specific author, meaning that we don't necessarily know who actually wrote this book. Uh, a lot of times when you read epistles, it's very clear in the introduction, it says, I am Paul writing to you and so on and so forth. But with Hebrews, it's a little bit different, but a lot of scholars tend to debate who the author is. But more importantly, the audience, right? The author clearly had a good idea of who the audience is. And when he wrote the book of Hebrews, he wrote it to the members of the church that were constantly being persecuted, right? Persecuted with the, the potential of death and whatnot. So he was writing to these people that are persecuted who were very tempted to abandon the ways of Christ and go back to their old ways in the past, right? He's writing to these group of believers to encourage them. But ultimately, his goal is to prevent, or the author's goal is to prevent believers from abandoning the faith. In theology, we call it apostasy. Right? But essentially, the author is writing to these believers to encourage them so that they remain and endure in the faith. And so when we have that background in, the, in sort of the back of our minds, and we, when we think about rule of life, because we sort of discuss what that is. What we have to understand from the very first couple of verses is that when it comes to our own rule of life, what we see from the text is how there is a need for sincerity and being Jesus-centered. Whatever rule of life that you come up with needs to follow the example that we see in Hebrews. And what we see in Hebrews is that the lifestyle of the Christians at the time of persecution, they were not only extremely sincere, but they were completely centered on Jesus. Now, I want to unpack that for us a little bit, right? Ooh, my formatting is off, so I apologize for that. But uh, when I'm talking about Jesus-centered, being Jesus-centered, right, we're talking about living in a way that's according to the Spirit as opposed to living in ways that are according to the flesh. So there is a distinct difference. And I put some examples up here in Galatians and Colossians. I actually have this up for us on the screen. In Galatians, I highlighted the uh, very specific part. But it says in chapter 3, verse 18, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Remember, we're trying to uh, create this dichotomy or look at these contrasting statements. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, which is an interesting one, enmity, strife, uh, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So these are all attributes of being like the flesh or having that fleshly uh, spirit in mind. It says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the spirit, um, but, I'm sorry, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. Verse 25, this is key. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So here in Galatians, it's giving us a very clear picture of life where it's according to the Spirit and life that's according to the flesh. 
Uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 10, it also sort of parrots what was mentioned. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, right? Earthly, fleshly, such as sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. All right, so here, again, we're seeing very specific ways for us to live according to the spirit and uh, living according to the flesh. And so when we're talking about being Jesus-centered in terms of how we set uh, a rule of life for ourselves, when we're talking about being Jesus-centered in terms of how we live our life in faith, how we commune with one another, and so on and so forth, there is a need for us to remember the attributes of the Spirit and abide by those things. So this is what we're talking about, or this is what I'm talking about when we're talking about sincerity and being Jesus-centered. Your rule of life, being Jesus-centered, remember, that is a core central theme. So because your rule of life is Jesus-centered, it will help you hold on to eternal hope and endure. If your rule of life is fo focused or centered on Jesus, then it will help you endure and hold on to the eternal hope that is in Christ. Right, what do I mean by this? In verses 22-23, uh, it says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with a heart sprinkled clean from an unconscious, uh, evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to confession of our hope without wavering, for uh, he who promised is faithful. What we're seeing here is an encouragement, first off, really briefly. We're seeing an encouragement to the people that are being persecuted. There is a call for the people to still hold deeply onto Christ, to not abandon the teachings, and to purify and to cleanse themselves so that they can continue to abide in the presence of God. I think verse 23 is particularly important for us because it says, Let us hold fast to confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. There is a very clear statement about how when we abide in Christ, we have reasons to hope because Christ will not fail us. He will not abandon us. When we place our hope in worldly things, when we place our hope in things that are very fleshly or fleeting, as an example, then we will always be met with disappointment. Why? Because our hope is contrasted in being temporal as opposed to being eternal. If our hope is in the temporal things, things that will not last, then there is obviously going to be more and more experiences where we, where we face disappointment and discouragement. But if our hope is not in the temporal, if we allow this to remain in the eternal aspect of what we're talking about, then we will continually set our eyes on Christ. We will continually see him, and we will continually realize that Christ is the one that is fueling us. He is the one that is providing for us. He is the one that is guiding us. And because he is active and present in our lives, we have reasons not only to hope, but also to endure as well. Hebrews 13, uh, verses 1 through 9, we see this uh, sort of explained again, right? Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby uh, some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though... Uh, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For, he's, uh, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Right? We're seeing this repeated again. God will still remain with us. If we go on to verses 6 through 9, it says, So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you and the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Right? These are all aspects as, uh, of us being Jesus-centered. Here in Hebrews, in the uh, final chapter, we're seeing an encouragement to hold on to God. 
We are uh, being told again and again that he will not abandon us. He is faithful. He will be with you. But these are things that we have to remember and follow. We cannot simply just say, I'm a Christian and think that God is going to do everything for us. No, we have very clear commands in terms of how we should posture our behavior and attitudes in and out of the church. So this is why it is so important for us to think about what does it mean to be Jesus-centered? What does it mean for, um, for me personally? What does it mean for me to abide in the Spirit as opposed to abiding in the flesh? Am I guilty of some of these things that have been listed? Am I guilty of sexual immorality? Am I guilty of adultery? Am I guilty of lying? Am I guilty of arrogance and so on and so forth? If I am guilty of any of these things, then our posture should be to turn back towards God, to repent, and to fix these things. Right? This also, I, I feel like it's important to say it's not a one-and-done type thing. A rule of life is essentially created to help you endure from now until the day that you're in heaven. And so I think this is such an important thing for us to realize. When it comes to being Jesus-centered, remind yourselves, remember that there are aspects Oh, it's terrible, right? But there are aspects of love, hospitality, being faithful in marriage, discern, uh, discerning God's truth, being free from the love of money or the world, and more. There's so many different attributes that helps us be centered on Jesus. But our individual responsibility is to think about what that looks like in our lives. If we have been unfaithful in any of these areas, then consider how we can draw back towards God. If we have placed other things like the love of money at the center of our lives, then we need to rethink about what this means, and we need to think about how we can put God back at the center of our lives. Having said all this, I, I lead us to our last point for today. Right? Your rule of life, according to Hebrews, right? your rule of life, it will help you hold on to the eternal hope and endure. We, we just talked about this. But what, what I'm talking about, it, your rule of life is meant to encourage and challenge the body of Christ. That's ultimately what, what I'm trying to get at today. Whatever rule of life you decide for yourself, whether it is prayer or fasting or whatever it is, ultimately it should not only just be an encouragement, not only should you be encouraged about your faith and the people around you be encouraged, but it is also something where you can challenge other people as well. Right? And we see this in verses 23 to 25. 23 is just a repeat of the, the previous point, but I thought it'd be important to restate this. It says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Right? There's that statement about Jesus never failing us. But here's where it gets very interesting. Verse 24, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I think this statement is impactful. Right? This, these three verses are giving us a clear picture of what it means to be encouraging and challenging as well. I think a lot of times in our busyness, a lot of times in sort of our discouragement, we tend to withdraw and isolate ourselves. And this isn't a church phenomena, folks, right? This is a typical psychological phenomena that we see. It's not even a phenomena. It's just a normal behavior, right? When we experience hardship, when we experience guilt and shame, when we are afraid of being exposed, our tendency either is to be extremely angry and completely blow up on people like some people have, or the the alternative is for us to realize, oh, this is very uncomfortable, and you're going to start withdrawing little by little by little, right? You're going to remove yourself from places of community and so on and so forth. But what the Bible is instructing us to do is to not neglect the people. Yes, it is completely understandable that your faith is in a tough spot. Yes, it is completely understandable that sometimes you don't want to see certain people at church, Yes, it is completely understandable that you are hurt or you are frustrated or you're discouraged, right? I, I, that's a normal thing. But here, we're not trying to condemn what you feel. We're not trying to condemn the fact that these things happen. These things have happened, and it's a shame that it happens in the church. But when we experience these challenges and hardship, what the Bible is teaching us is to draw closer and closer to God's people, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. When you come up with these rules of life for yourself, 
when you tell yourself, I want to do this for God, I want to grow in my relationship with God, all these things are excellent statements. But as you're doing these things, you have to consider whether or not what you're doing is actually an encouragement to the body. Right? If you're not in the habit of praying, for example, right, and, you, and uh, you decide for yourself, you know what, I'm going to start, this is my new rule of life, I'm going to start praying every week. Right? And, and maybe this is new. Let's just say that this is completely new and you're doing this. And at some point, you feel this conviction to actually attend maybe the 10 o'clock prayer meeting that we have here in, in YNLA. Right? You attending, you committing to your rule of life, you showing up, and you being with people is an encouragement. It may challenge others to do the same, but first and foremost, what you're doing is an encouragement to the body. And we have to think about those things. But I think what happens more often than not is we tell ourselves, oh, maybe what I'm doing isn't important enough. Oh, maybe people don't care about my presence. Maybe people don't care if I show up. But that's absolutely false. Right? Think about just for a moment, if you're at a random place like Starbucks or Target or whatever, right? You're shopping or you're doing something and you run into someone that you haven't seen in five years. Will that not be a moment of encouragement? Will that not be a happy moment? Now, unless you see someone you don't like, that's a whole different conversation. But generally speaking, if you see a friend that you haven't seen in about five years or so, you're going to be filled with joy in very briefly. And you're probably going to spend a little bit of a moment to catch up. Much like how we would be hospitable and joyful when we see people we haven't seen in a long time, this is also true of us being here today. It is always a joy for Pastor Kevin and, and the people that are serving to see people show up. It is always a joy to see people serving. It is always a joy to see people caring for one another. Right? These are all things that are encouraging and challenging. What you do personally, even if you dismiss it within yourself, even if you tell yourself what I do is not that important, it is important to the kingdom of God. It is important to Jesus. This is why the author, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of being killed off, in the midst of being threatened to turn back to Judaism, as opposed to believing in Christianity, the author makes it a point to say, don't neglect meeting each other, but to encourage one another again and again and again. Our rule of life, as we think about this, it should encompass all these things, because this is the example that we see in Hebrews. We need to be sincere and centered on Jesus. We need to hold on to this hope that comes from him. And we need to endure. But in so doing, as we're doing all these things, we also need to be an encouragement to ourselves and to other people around us. And to challenge one another as well. A rule of life, typically speaking, right, we're going to see a couple of different components. Right? There is a very personal component. Meaning, what are you going to be responsible for? We know what it is. We know that it's a precise, intentional plan. We know that it's not something as, as abstract and blasé as saying, I'm going to pray more. We know that we have to be meticulous with these things. So for us that are thinking about how we can set a rule of life for ourselves, ask yourself, what are you going to be responsible for? How are you going to live that out? Be as specific as possible. Having said that, there's also a relational component Think about how your rule of life will affect your relationship with people, right? Maybe your spouse, maybe your children, maybe your parents, maybe friends and so on and so forth, right? What sort of impact is your rule of life going to have with people? But we also have one final component, and this is kind of a fun one. It's the experimental one. What are some things, uh, oh, bad grammar, excuse me. All right, what are some practices you would like to try as a means of maturing as a believer? Maybe it's about time that instead of us just saying, I want a better relationship with God, we actually put, uh, put that to action. Maybe for some of us that say, I just need to pray more, maybe it's about time we start coming out to 10 o'clock uh, uh, prayer meetings. Maybe for those of us that are saying, oh, I should probably serve the church, uh, maybe we'll find ways to volunteer, whether it's at other ministries or whether it's even in YNLA. Maybe for those of us that are saying, I need to hear God better, maybe it's about time we started fasting to really think about what it is that we're giving up and to pray in those moments where we're deeply uh, impacted by hunger. But these are all things that we ought to be considering as we think about our rule of life. So therefore, all I can say today is set for yourself a rule of life and commit to it to abide in the hope that is in Christ. This is uh, sort of the foundational thing of what we're talking about today. Right? I think one thing I want to remind us of is to be very wary 
right? Because there are typical commitments that we make. Right? We, we make these commitments because we want to achieve a certain goal, right? Like maybe we want to sleep six to eight hours a day. And so if we want to, uh, if we want to commit to this, then we need to adjust our life to a certain schedule. Right? Uh, we want to exercise and eat healthy. Yes, those are great goals. But to, to uh, yeah, we want to do this all for the sake of our health. But maybe we need to get specific as to how we can actually accomplish those things. We, we tell ourselves we maybe we'll uh, spend more time with family and friends and we want to express love and have a great time and all these things. And, and maybe we want to work harder to, to meet deadlines or get a promotion. Right? These are typical commitments that we naturally make within just us living. It's a consequence of us working and living. But what we have to remember is that a rule of life, it might have similarities, but ultimately it is a little bit different. And the reason why is because of this statement. The vision for your rule of life should be to honor God by refreshing yourself spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. Right? Whatever rule of life you have is not just an abstract conception, but it is something specific. It is something intentional. It is something purposeful and guided. And it has the capacity to, to renew and restore our mind the way that God wants it to be renewed and restored. I'm going to ask um, Daniel to come up and play some pretty music because um, uh, I need that. But... You know, as we sort of talk about this and begin to wrap up, Joel, if you can actually grab those uh, things. So uh, we're going to do something a little bit more reflection-based today, right? And I totally understand that we might be out of uh, papers, and if so, that's okay. Use your phones. But uh, Joel and some others are going to hand out some pens and some papers. And on that sheet, you're going to see uh, the title of today's message, today's date, and also you're going to see three numbered points, and they're blank, three numbered points. Okay, and what we're going to do for the remainder of the time that we have, because we don't have too much time left, right, as we're reflecting and sort of thinking about your, our relationship with God, what I'd like to ask us to do in this moment is to come up with three rules of life for yourself. Come up with three, physically write it down. The pens work, I, I think. Right, but physically write this down. And also, after you write it down, maybe pray over it, but also tape it up in your bathroom or something. So that every time you go to brush your teeth, every time you come out of the shower, every time you go to pee or poo or whatever, right, that, that you will see that as a reminder of what we need to be doing. Your rule of life. Ooh. Let me go back, all right? Um, you're writing down at least three rules of life. You're writing down one personal, one relational, and one experimental that you will commit yourself to. Uh, I have some examples for us, right, in case we're not certain about what kind of things we should be setting. But perhaps it's time we started practicing silence and solitude once a week. Uh, what I mean by silence and solitude, where maybe once a week you take just half an hour of your day, right, that half an hour you spend watching Netflix or Hulu or whatever, you spend that half an hour just sitting in complete silence, reflecting on God and praying to Him. Now that's a hard one. Right? Half an hour is a very long time. Now, the, the, the good news is, like, half an hour is feasible and it's manageable. When I assign this uh, to my students at, uh, I guess, at the university, it's usually about three hours. Right? They have to do this for three hours. But for us, it's just half an hour. Right? That's an example. Another example, maybe we need to incorporate daily prayer rhythms at the start and end of every day. Maybe as soon as you wake up, you need to just spend some time in prayer. Maybe right before you uh, hit the bed, you just need to spend a little bit of time in prayer. Maybe we need to start engaging in prayer rhythms. And if that's, if that's the case, then great. Right? Maybe that's a rule of life to set for yourself. And another example, oh, driving me nuts here, but another example, join a small group or Bible study to sharpen your understanding of Scripture. Maybe this is another rule of life that we need to set for ourselves where we can intentionally be with other people as well. So spend maybe about two more minutes because it's 11.58. Spend about two minutes just thinking about these things. Write it down and, uh, and then pray over it.
If you need more time, feel free to wrap up, but uh, I'll pray for us at this time. Lord, as we reflect on uh, 2023, um, maybe for some of us, we feel a little bit of shame. We feel a little bit of discouragement because uh, maybe we've drifted away from you. Maybe some of us feel embarrassed because of the things that we've done. And maybe some of us are filled with hope and joy because um, this was just, uh, just a great year. Lord, all of us are in different places in our lives. But I believe that all of us are also in need of encouragement no matter where we are. Lord, you see the struggles that we endure day in and day out. You know how difficult it is for us to be faithful, not just to you, but even to the things that we have uh, in, in regularly in our lives. Lord, you see how we struggle, you see how we work hard, and sometimes it feels purposeless and meaningful. But Lord, your actions on the cross, what you have done, all that you have done, Lord Jesus, brings hope to every believer. All that you have done gives us the encouragement that we need to endure. And so, Lord, I pray today that you'd help us find it, uh, all these things in you, Lord God. As we set a rule of life for ourselves to commit to within 2024, as we uh, tape this against our, our mirrors or uh, our bedrooms or wherever it is, Lord, I pray that you would always remind us how you are walking with us and that you are calling us to be in your presence. And so, Lord, I pray for encouragement. I pray for uh, strength. I pray for courage that even in moments where we fail, that we can always turn back to you to, to uh, thrive and to be committed in your presence, Lord God. So I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. As we wrap up uh, our service, let's just all stand up for Abel. We're going to sing all glory be to Christ once more as a church, as a response song. So let's sing together. Should nothing of our ever stand, no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive. Oh, glory be to 
Let's pray. Lord, as we wrap up this year, um, I pray that you would help us finish strong, that you would help us be centered solely on you, Lord God. As we go out to spend time with our family and friends, as we spend time eating with one another, Lord, I pray that you'd remind us time and time again how much you love us, how much you love the people that we're with, Lord, and that you have made all things possible and that we have reasons to hope and endure till the promised day. So, uh, God, I just ask for that strength and encouragement and discernment to endure. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the abundant love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. All right, have a great week. Uh, please don't forget, we have an 11 o'clock service, New Year's service, if you're coming out to that. At college, I need the money. <laughs> <laughs>